Hi folks, about four weeks ago, maybe six weeks ago, I asked you guys to vote on the community page of my channel uh, for which video you wanted me to do next as a freebie, and you folks voted for, it was, the Psychology of Movie Extras. Uh, and I've taken my time getting around to doing it because I've been busy with other things. I've been busy with video game programming. Uh, and also, you folks voted for a video which, at that time, was the one out of the four options that I was least interested in doing. Um, and I, I was like, oh, no, they voted for that one. I wanted them to vote for one of the other three. But you folks voted for that one, so I feel like I should deliver on it. The other day, I was thinking about it. Okay, Psychology of Movie Extras, let's get into this. And um, I went and hunted down, uh, I've made a page of notes on it, so I'm going to use this page as the basis. Oh, and one thing about this, and this was something that was putting me off making the video as well. Because I've talked before um, in recent months about the difficulty with using movie clips uh, in my film analysis videos and the videos frequently getting blocked uh, by people who work in the copyright offices of those film studios. Uh, they don't recognize fair use uh, for educational film analysis videos, so they keep uh, applying to YouTube to get the videos blocked. And that was putting me off because I was thinking, if I do a very detailed long video on the psychology of movie extras and I use a lot of clips from a lot of different movies, the chances of one of those clips triggering a block uh, from one of the many companies, uh, the chances are very high. So I'm going to try and do this video without using clips from the movies, although I may mention some examples. But before we get into that, I'm just going to mention that uh, I've actually, when I was trying to hunt down my notes on the psychology of movie extras, I ended up going through a ton of other notes on other subjects. And I came across a load of things where I was thinking, oh, I should do a video on this. I should do a video on that. Okay, so I'm going to record this one on the psychology of movie extras. And then I'm going to record some of these. I don't know how many of them I'm going to get through today. This one on psychology of movie extras will be a freebie on YouTube. The other ones will be available to my Patreon supporters and uh, probably as um, sale items on my site or, or an individual sale item if I manage to condense it all enough. And before we continue as well, uh, there is a series of discounts available on my website on lots and lots of my other videos and articles, ranging from 20 to 70% off. Uh, there's about 40 items, something like that. So go to the website, grab those if you want a load of extra content. Um, also, as I mentioned recently, uh, my video game has been released, which is called To The Death. That's available on Steam. Head to the website, grab a copy of that. If you enjoy it, or, or even if you don't enjoy it, um, play the game for a few hours, give me some feedback, email me, or leave a review on Steam saying exactly what you think of it, and be truthful and honest, because I value the feedback and I want to make this the best game that I can. Um, oh, and also Patreon support. Yeah, you can get a whole bunch of extra content on there uh, by becoming a monthly supporter. Okay, so let's get into the psychology of movie extras. Okay, so the first thing I wrote about this uh, was that movie extras must be mundane and like clockwork uh, so that they don't interfere with the narrative uh, and so that they don't interfere with the portrayal of the central characters. And so to that effect, you'll typically have movie extras who are designed to sort of move in the background but not become uh, prominent visually. If you've got like a, a grey and brown sort of set and your characters are wearing dull colors then you don't want some someone walking past in the background who's wearing bright green or something you know because uh, then the, just the, the color psychology of it they stand out a mile away one movie that i've been intending to do a detailed review on for a long time because it's very underappreciated artistically although it was commercially huge was the old western movie the magnificent seven in terms of colors that movie is worth watching regarding the costumes of the characters. Uh, your central characters in that film, a lot of them have got, uh, they are colour-coded uh, in their, their costumes so that they stand out. Loads and loads of the extras in that film have got these really bland colours. You've got the farmers, who these cowboys are trying to protect, and they all just wear white all the time and a bit of brown. And you've got the enemies, 
who don't wear white, but they wear lots of brown and maybe a bit of black, but they all seem to have the same colours. They might look a little bit different in the types of hats they wear and the types of clothes, but the colours are always the same. But your central characters, you've got the lead character, the lead cowboy, he's the only character in the whole movie who dresses completely in black. So when you see a bunch of characters in an action scene, he stands out. If you see a guy who's dressed all in black, uh, you know it's the central character because nobody else is dressed all in black. The lead villain in the, the film, he's the only character who wears a bright red uh, shirt. Uh, and it makes him stand out separately from all of his villain followers. You know, the, the villain has got like about 40 cowboys who follow him. Yeah, he, he wears re a red shirt, which is a real standout colour, and also, you know, connotations of anger and evil from him, you know, with the colour red, intensity, and uh, all of his followers just wear bland colours. So if you see an action scene with a bunch of bad guys running around, you know that that, that red flash of shirt, that's your lead villain. And then you've got, uh, I think, Steve McQueen, McQueen's character, he wears a pink shirt, which cracked me up, um, but he's still great in the film. And then you've got uh, Charles Bronson's character. He's, I think he's the only one who wears a sky blue shirt. So yeah, check out The Magnificent Seven, the original one, the classic one from the 1960s. That movie is brilliant on so many levels. Uh, but just the, the color psychology there is fantastic. And I, I did notice, I didn't watch all of it, but the 2018 remake of The Magnificent Seven, I watched bits of it and it was so bad I couldn't bring myself to watch it all. But... Everybody dresses in fucking black or dark brown. So when you've got a big action scene, I can't tell who's fighting. I, I can't recognise who's who. They've all got big hats on, so I can't see the faces properly. So it just becomes, here's a bunch of guys shooting each other, and I don't know who's who. So, yeah, that's an example. But, yeah, with, with reference to movie extras, everyone in the background, aside from the lead characters in that film, you know, kind of dull, non-standout colours. And that's kind of a general uh, rule. You want your background characters to be to not grab too much attention. And then there's other things, like you don't want background characters who've got really unusual characteristics. Like if, uh, you know, in real life, you might be walking down the street and a midget could walk past. Or someone who's like six foot eight could walk past. You know, I remember walking into a cafe a while ago and there was a guy in there who was six foot nine and he stood out a mile away. I walked in, I was like, whoa, you know, he grabbed my attention. If I was there to meet a friend in the cafe, I would I would notice the six foot nine guy before I noticed my own friend, probably. And I actually went up to the guy and I said, excuse me. And he just turned to me and he said, six foot nine, because he just gets everyone asking him about it. And we had a good laugh about it. But yeah, so in your background, you don't want characters who are too tall, who are too short. You don't want someone who's like extremely fat or someone who, you know, Nothing visually that stands out too much. And so you don't get so much things like uh, pregnant women. You, you hardly ever get pregnant women in the background in a movie, but you see them in everyday life. So that's the first thing, is keep your background characters mundane and like clockwork. I'm not saying that's the way it should be, but I'm saying that's the sort of general rule that seems to be unconsciously followed, uh, or maybe consciously followed, depending on the filmmakers. Uh, next up, thematic uses of people in the background. There's quite a few movies that do this really well. One that springs to mind, which I've done a video on before, is uh, the old 1960s movie The Graduate. Oh, and by the way, this isn't just going to be all 1960s examples. It just happens to be a couple of 1960s movies that came to mind. I was born in the 1970s. Uh, so for those of you who say, oh, boomer, uh, duh, no. Boomers weren't born in the 1970s. They were born before my time, so... Ah. Okay, so using extra thematically, uh, in the graduate film, the lead character, he's got, like, issues with... The, he, he, wants, um, he wants a girlfriend. Right from the start of the beginning, he's lonely, he wants a girlfriend. And so you keep getting these moments in the first half of the, the film where he keeps passing by couples who look who look happy. If you watch the whole title sequence of that film, there's a long sequence where he's walking through an airport, he's collecting his luggage, he's going home. It's all like clockwork, and he hates the system that he's in, and, and the airport system is a nice metaphor for him hating uh, the academic class system that he operates in, because he's got rich parents who demand that he performs a, um, certain duties in life and so on. 
But during that whole opening sequence, you will see happy-looking couples passing him by, and sometimes he even glances at them. Now, if you're not paying attention to that kind of thing, you just think, oh, it's just people in the background. But those are examples of um, how extras can be used thematically to reflect upon a lead character's state of mind or to reflect upon what they're thinking about. Another movie uh, uh, example that springs to mind, uh, this is a 1970s film, uh, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. There was one little moment in that film that always stood out to me and I always wondered, what the hell's all that about? And then it occurred to me when I was thinking about this topic of movie extras. There's a little scene in that film where uh, De Niro's taxi driver character, he's driving around and he's looking at people on the streets. And and actually he's talking in some of the scenes, he's talking about his opinions of other people in the world around him and you're actually seeing extras. In fact, that's another movie example where you've got a lonely lead character who keeps passing by happy-looking couples on the street who've got linked arms and stuff. And that's a reflection of how he feels lonely, like other people, other guys have got a girlfriend, and he hasn't. And that is constantly shown throughout the movie through with the extras on the streets. But there was one little moment in that film that, that always freaked me out. It was a memorable scene. He's driving along, and he sees... A guy walking along the street who is really angry, who's screaming, not to anyone in particular, he's screaming to himself. The angry guy's walking along the street and he's shouting, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. I'm going to blow his brains out or something like that. And it's got nothing to do with the the actual plot uh, of the film, uh, with the lead character's story. It's just some irrelevant extra. And that's a really great scene because in life you get people in the street who act in ways that are crazy and grab our attention but have nothing to do with our own personal narrative and it's quite distracting. So when you get that in the movie Taxi Driver, you know, it shows the chaos and randomness of the city around them and how incidental people who are walking around can be dangerous and stuff like that so there's that aspect to it but i realized last time i saw the film that there's another element to that scene de niro's character is quite angry about seeing uh, the young jo- uh, jodie foster plays the young girl who's a prostitute uh, she's uh, she's not even a teenager i think she says she's 12 and a half and she's a prostitute on the streets of new york and uh, De Niro's character is really, uh, Travis Bickle, that's his name, is it? Travis is really angry about uh, this girl being pimped out on the streets. And right, I think it's right after he sees uh, her walking along the streets and she's all dressed up to do her, pimping act- uh, her prostitution activities. And it's right after he sees her that he turns and sees this guy walking along the street who's screaming with anger, talking about wanting to blow someone's brains out, but also what, talking about wanting to kill a woman who's angered him. Because that, that's a, an interesting aspect of um, Travis Bickle. He's not just angry at the prostitutes, he's also angry at women for rejecting him. So there's, when this guy walks along who's anger, who, who's angry, I view that as being a, an extra in the background who's being used to portray the emotions of the Travis Bickle character. We're seeing it as an extra, but it's actually his own thoughts and feelings. It's him who wants to blow someone's brains out, which he eventually does later in the film. It's him who wants to kill some woman. Uh, he never actually does that, but you know he shows signs of being an extreme stalker and potentially leading to violence and stuff. So, yeah, that's a, a good example of how uh, extras in the background can be used thematically uh, to portray aspects of the lead character's state of mind. But it doesn't have to be just the lead character's state of mind. It can be used for other things. If you're shooting a horror film or something and you want there to be a pervading sense of unease, you can have background characters who who look a little bit sinister. Nothing that really grabs conscious attention, but just unconsciously uh, it could be like, Ooh, who the hell is that? Perhaps, I think Nightmare on Elm Street's got little bits of that as well uh, where there are incidental characters who are uh, sort of like little reminders of the Freddy Krueger's 
pervading presence throughout the film and that was actually scripted to be that as well uh, that way as well there was going to be a lot of stuff about colored elements in the environment that that match with uh, Freddy Krueger's uh, red and green sweater although in the the script it was a red and yellow sweater so they're going to have red and yellow objects all over the place in the environment throughout the film that would be constant reminders that Freddy might be present disguised as an object. And in the finished film, if I remember rightly, there are elements of that reminders of Freddy's potential presence. And the the biggest and most obvious one is when a a girl who's walking in the, the, the school is dressed in the same sweater as Freddy. And then it's made a bit too obvious because she pulls up her hand and she's got the Freddy claws. So yeah, using characters thematically can be really great. It's great to uh, pay attention to that in movies. Uh, sometimes it's great to just watch it, take a particular movie that you love, you're already familiar with the plot, and just go through it and say, I'm going to pay attention to one aspect of this film. This On this viewing, I'm going to play, pay special attention to the extras in the background. Surprise them what you can learn. Parallels with the lead character, and I've made a note here on... The Coen Brothers movie called The Man Who Wasn't There. The lead character, he goes to visit his wife who is in prison. She's been accused of a murder she didn't commit. He goes to visit her and he can't express his emotions. And she has trouble expressing emotions as well. And the two of them are just sort of sat there talking to each other very blandly, very coldly. But next to them, there is another couple, um, a guy and a woman, you know, to women's prison. And... Um, The guy is visiting her and she is crying her eyes out and they're having a big emotional dramatic thing and it's right in the background of your two lead characters. So you've got camera here looking that way. You can see your two lead characters, man and woman, but they're not communicating. Uh, They're not expressing their emotions. But in the background, you've got another couple who mirror them who are expressing their emotions. Yeah, that's another example of how you can use extras to express emotions which the central characters have, but they themselves are not expressing. Uh, the proximity of extras. Yeah, this this one you could probably do a lot of um, detailed study on. How close should you have your extras in the background? If you've got your two lead characters who are in the conversation, you have a lot, you're having a lot of close shots where you can see their facial expressions and so on. Having your background extras far away keeps them distance keeps them separate uh, conceptually separate so they don't interfere if you've got your extras in the background who are closer up where you can see their faces you can see their lips move you might not hear the dialogue but you can see the lips move and you can see them reacting to each other with the emotional expressions that can be interfering people can be distracted by that i mean a lot of people are very primed to pay attention to other people's emotional states and i'm very much like that myself you know, I, I can be sat in an environment um, either on my own or with a friend or with a few people and chatting and stuff. And I will often find my attention wandering to people who I've never met and just noticing their emotional states, uh, noticing what they're noticing, noticing who they're talking to, what's going on for them. I'm very interested in what's going on for other people. And, you know, I, because I'm like that, like if I'm sat in a a cafe or a restaurant or something and if there's a kid on the next table or a baby I'm always the type of guy who will sort of glance at the kid and wave and oh hello and and the baby will start looking at me and I'll start pulling faces at it or something and I've, I've often had this thing over the years where young kids on nearby tables and restaurants and cafes they tend to notice me because I'm noticing them and not just with kids but with adults as well and it's kind of like this is a quite an interesting thing. Kids are very primed to notice who is paying attention to them. I've, I've noticed a lot of time with young kids, if somebody comes along who is pretending to take an interest in the kid, because the kid isn't so much a verbal thinker, the kid will often notice what's going on and will notice that the adult isn't really interested in them um, and doesn't really want to know them. Whereas if someone is genuinely enthusiastic, the kid will respond. So I've often had a thing, because I notice other people and I pay attention to them, I've often had people who sort of come to me and they want to talk to me or kids want to talk to me or whatever, uh, because they know that I'm aware of their thought process, their, their situation. They know that I'm noticing them, so they start noticing me and taking interest in me. It's a funny thing, that's like... 
extras in real life that is isn't it you know a lot of us we we go through life uh, particularly if we live in a very crowded city like you know if you're in london you don't want to be paying attention to everybody around you because there's so many people on the streets there you're struggling to walk down the streets in london uh, because just the streets are so crowded so you have to block everyone out you know the crowded streets of london it would be a very difficult place to shoot a dialogue scene if you're going to do it realistically because there's too many distractions. Uh, you'd have people walking right past the camera up close and stuff like that. So, yeah, I just I think there's this general thing with uh, scenes in movies, dialogue scenes, where you've got a couple of central characters and all of the background extras get visually pushed away. They, they're physically moved away or they're kept out of focus. You don't want their faces to be prominent. You don't want their personal life stories to be played out too much because the audience will start going, oh, what's going on for that person? Oh, why has that woman got that expression on her face uh, just over the, the lead character's shoulder? It's too distracting. So, yeah, you have to block people out in that way and but real life isn't like that you know often we're having a big dramatic experience and there can be someone who walks right past very close and they've got something going on and their narrative can suddenly interfere with your narrative in some unexpected way even if it's only unconscious Uh, so we try to avoid that in movies and something else that often goes on again i'll go back to the movie the graduate that's a very interesting movie for extras sometimes you can have the extras moving around in the foreground of your shot, but they're out of focus. That that happens a lot. They're usually out of focus because you use a zoom shot. The Graduate, uh, the old 60s film, is a really good one for this. There's a lot of scenes in that film where characters are shot from a long distance, you know, like a zoom lens, almost like you're watching animals in the wild. And there is actually a zoo scene in the film where you know animals are shown and there's a parallel between the human characters and the caged animals. Uh, Because, like, The Graduate is almost like a nature movie about people and society uh, in certain circumstances. So it's like we're watching animals. like It's like a nature documentary. It's very good in that respect. And so you get this zoom lens thing, just like when we see a documentary about lions and tigers and stuff, uh, you know, in a... a in an African jungle or in a, a you know the, the the plains of Africa, the um, giraffes or elephants or whatever, and you know a lot of the time they're shot with zoom lenses because if the camera if the camera crew get too close and the animals attack them, so you shoot them with a long zoom lens, and because you're shooting with the long zoom lens and you're following them from a distance, uh, sometimes you get things that pass by in the foreground that are out of focus, usually trees and bushes and things like that, but some movies such as The Graduate. Uh, they do this, but with people moving around in the foreground, passing back and forth as well. Uh, so yeah, th- that can be uh, quite interesting and unusual. And uh, the whole zoom lens thing with characters is is pretty cool. It's like we're watching from a real distance, and uh, you know you can you can get the close up shot of the person with the expression on their face, and it singles them out because once you get that zoom shot in. The character is in focus. Everyone in the background and the foreground is out of focus. It's a good way of of making sure that the attention is only on your central character's narrative and other people's emotions, uh, the extras uh, in the shot. They, their narratives don't interfere because they are visually out of focus. So that's a, a, good, thing, a good thing about zoom shots. Just on the, on the subject of all this, I, you know, I kind of wonder: do movies feel less real because we have these kinds of rules on extras? I'm not finished with the list here, by the way, but it's just a question that's just sort of popped into my mind. Do we need to have these rules on extras? Uh, there are definitely arguments for it, but what would it be like if we had movies where background extras were just where they could interfere with the narrative and draw attention to themselves, as happens in real life. And that's actually something I found with my own low-budget filmmaking. Sometimes I would shoot uh, street scenes, and because I wasn't working with budgets, you know, I was just paying out of my own pocket for making these movies, sometimes I'd just shoot stuff on the streets, and there would be just people in the background, regular people, uh, um, who weren't paid extras, they weren't actors or anything, and they would just incidentally end up in shot. And I was often surprised during the edit how much these people stood out because they weren't arranged to not stand out. 
you know, you get you get the classic thing of people looking at the camera uh, when they know there's a camera present, and sometimes I'd have to shoot scenes, and there'd be people hanging around, and or you, you get like teenagers are like, oh, I'm on camera, and I'd just say, yeah, okay, go on, get it all out of your system, I'm recording, so we'll have a laugh at it later. Get it out of your system, whatever it is you want to do, okay, and then well, and then we'll do our shot, you know. And some of them sometimes they keep messing around. They just be like, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, bored. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's dead funny. That. That's really funny. How original, just jumping around, uh, acting like an idiot because there's a camera on you. You've never had the camera on you. You know, uh, it would often end up with uh, situations like that. So you get people reacting to the fact that they know that there's a camera. But surprisingly, a lot of people would just go along with it. They saw that there's a camera. They can see that you're shooting something that's fiction. And a lot of people would just walk past and, and almost go into acting mode. <laughs> and they, they would sort of, um, it's like they, they would realize, oh, I'm I'm actually in somebody else's short film or whatever at the moment. I'm in the background, so I should just act normal. And they would overact the normal, <laughs> not look at anything. and I'll just walk straight. Or they don't want to be seen. They don't want their face to be seen and stuff like that. So I always find that interesting how people reacted to being accidental extras uh, in short films that I was making. The physical movements of extras as well, not having them do stuff that, is, that grabs too much attention. Uh, you know, if you, you, you're shooting a couple of characters who are sat down in a public environment, and they're talking, and in the background you've got people sat at another table. Now, if in the middle of the conversation, all those people at the table in the background suddenly stand up and leave the venue, that's going to stand out to the viewer. So typically we have the background extras um, doing something which usually involves just being sat there or just walking past. And whatever it is that they are doing is an extremely simple thing that is continuous that doesn't get broken. Uh, so you don't get a character who walks past in the background, stops, looks in their bag or looks in the pockets and says, oh, I've lost my keys, I've lost my wallet, or I forgot this, and oh, I better turn around and walk back the other way. You get that in real life, but you don't want that happening in the background with movie extras because it conveys a narrative that is separate and interfering with the, the main character's narrative. Uh, the interaction of extras with the lead characters can often convey things. One scene that stands out to me from memory on this is the movie Rumblefish, which is by Francis Ford Coppola. Very underrated film, absolute classic, superb on so many levels. For years I've been wanting to do a video on it, don't think I ever got around to it. But anyway, in Rumblefish, the lead character has got an alcoholic father, and we never see him really get angry at his own father, but there's one scene later in the movie where the lead character's drunk. He's a young guy. He's played by Matt Dillon. Good performance. And he's walking down the street drunk. And there's music blasting. And there's loads and loads of people passing by. A lot of extras. That's a very good movie for studying extras, by the way. And at one point, a, a drunk guy comes walking past. And the lead character says to him, Get the hell out of my way. And pushes him on the floor. Hey, ugly. Get the fuck out of my way. Hey. What are you doing? Don't do that, Steve. Don't bug. And, you know, I mean, that's, to me, that, that is like an expression of the, the lead character's anger against his own alcoholic father and how his father's let him down. He's angry at him. But that's never said in the movie. And the scenes with the father never show that. So, yeah, that's a, a good example of how you can have a, a lead character interact with an extra uh, in a way that says something about the lead character. And in those situations, the extra can often be a stand-in for somebody else uh, who the, the lead character wants to express something towards. And actually, real life is like that as well. You know, if you ever get people in the street who they've got a lot of anger with them towards people um, in the past who've upset them or perceived wrongs and so on, often people carry that anger and they very easily go off the rails against incidental everyday people. Uh, in the street and it's surprising how ridiculous it can be I mean you, you get like uh, young lads who've grown up in a thuggish neighbourhood uh, where everyone's aggressive and fighting and there's always a threat of physical violence and then they go into a new environment and they pass incidental just everyday people in the street and if somebody looks at them uh, just catches their eye they'll say what the hell are you looking at and they, like, they'll want to fight 
But it's not the incidental person who's walking past who they want to fight. It's people from their own past who they're angry with. The person who they're passing in the street, subconsciously for them, they are encountering somebody who did something to them in the past and they're reacting to that. That's a very natural part of human behavior. We tend to, because we don't know much about the people who we come across uh, in daily life, the people we've never actually met, we tend to project onto those people our perceptions of people we've met in the past and we react to new people on that basis quite a lot so that that works very very well in movies because it's a natural part of the human psyche i've wrote here extras reacting to key events or not reacting to them a bunch of characters are, are present in a scene in a movie and something gets exploded in the background if all the extras don't react to that explosion it's going to look weird or it might even say something about the situation so a lot of the time we have the extras re just react to something in conventional ways and the extras will often express an emotion that we are supposed to have, the audience. If there's an explosion in the background, the filmmakers want us, the audience, it's an unexpected explosion, they want us to react with a, with a oh my God, what's happened? Is everyone okay? So because the filmmakers want us to feel like that, they show the extras reacting like that. Um, and it's almost like we are the extras. <laughs> yeah, that, That's a funny, interesting thing, that the relationship between extras in the movie and the audience as unseen ex extras who are observing what's going on. That's a, a fascinating little subject in itself. And actually a classic example of that, uh, this is another video I've wanted to uh, do for years and never got around to, is the subject of canned laughter. You know, we watch comedy shows on TV and... We're supposed to laugh at the jokes, but just in case we don't, the filmmakers, the editors, they've dubbed in a bunch of people laughing. And who are these people? Who are these canned laughter people? You know, we're sat there watching the TV show, it's a comedy, and you might be alone in the room or with two family members or something, and you're watching a comedy, and you can hear all these other people laughing as if you're part of an audience. That, that, that I find fascinating the psychology of that and the psychology of why we only get canned laughter in TV shows, but we don't get it in movies. But there are other forms of this kind of expression. You know, very often extras are used in movies or TV shows and their reactions to things are supposed to lead us because we, as humans, we tend to have a, a habit of following the crowd in terms of our thoughts and feelings. The last one I've got on the list here is whether the, the extras have a similarity or difference in appearance to the lead characters. So, you know, if you've got like an action movie, you've got a hero central character, he is going to typically look muscular and tough and probably handsome as well. And on that basis, you know, you're going to have background extras who are going to be the opposite of that so that the lead character looks even more tough by example. Although you might have some villains who rival them in that respect. But incidental people in the background usually don't have that. So, you know, he, he, like the movie First Blood, which is fantastic. You know, Sylvester Stallone's best film, in my opinion. Uh, you know, he's the big muscular guy, he's the tough soldier and stuff. At the start of the movie, there's a lot of extras in the town that he visits. But you don't see any guys walking around there with t-shirts and muscles because that would totally detract it's like your lead character he's the guy who's tough he's the guy with the muscles uh, and even the cops in the police station are not muscular so that's a typical standard thing <clears throat> where you have extras and supporting characters who are intentionally chosen not to have the key traits that are supposed to be present in the central character and this makes the key traits of the central character seem even stronger. It makes them stand out even more. It makes that character seem more individual um, compared to everybody else. Whereas in real life, uh, you could get two two guys who, who who are on the verge of getting into a fight in the street, and somebody else might walk past who's a big muscle guy and just looks at them and is like, yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, and suddenly those two guys who are on the verge of getting into a fight don't look so tough because Mr. Muscle has just walked past with his 
<laughs> tight t-shirts and his big muscles bulging. But you don't get that in an action movie. You don't get extras who are as muscular as the central character hardly ever. And you get this with loads of other things. You got like a romantic comedy. You will, you know, you 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 know the, the old classic thing of your two lead characters usually have to be like the best looking people in the movie. Or there might be some rival who is a bit sexier in a, a sort of maybe a slutty way or something like that. Uh, but the two lead characters generally have to be more physically attractive than almost all of the extras. Funny, I was watching As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. I watched that with my daughter a couple of weeks ago and we really enjoyed it. It was great going back to that one. And that that's a really good romantic comedy because, well, for lots of different reasons, it's a great film. But one of the things is that your two lead characters are not your typical Hollywood types. Uh, Jack Nicholson is a much older actor, so he can't play the dashing, young, handsome guy in that film. And Helen Hunt, she's a good actress. She's I, Personally, I always thought she was kind of average looking. I don't mean to take anything away from her. She's a good actress. And maybe the fact that, maybe that's a compliment to her that she's able to get that role and play it well, uh, despite not being a conventionally good looking actress in the Hollywood sense. But that movie has got lots and lots and lots of extras in it. And I don't think I spotted a hell of a lot of very attractive extras in that film. Extras. So, yeah, there, there can be exceptions to this stuff. Uh, but usually I find incidental extras are not usually intensely good-looking or intensely ugly because extremes of perceived beauty tend to stand out to us. You know, you, somebody walks in the room and they ex- and you, if you think they're really ugly, you're going to be like, oh, my God, you know. Somebody walks in the room is extremely attractive and everyone's like, whoa, who's that, you know. So with a lot of movies, you, you tend to get in terms of ugliness or beauty you don't get the extremes and the extras usually except sometimes when you've got like a movie or a tv show like i don't know baywatch or something like that you know sometimes the narrative itself in the film is pretty lame and boring and sometimes the filmmakers will try and spruce that up a bit by having lots of really good looking people in the background so i guess the, the kind of logic of that would kind of be like Okay, we've got a boring story here. We've got crap acting. We've got crap dialogue. You might be interested in the crap script we've wrote. But just in case you're not entertained, here's a load of stunning women in the background. Here's some muscly fellas to keep the attention of you women. And, you know, there are, there are some movies and TV shows that are almost worth watching just because there's a load of great-looking extras in the background. With comedies, you can have background extras who look really bizarre and crazy. You know, old Monty Python and things like that. Sometimes you get background extras who are intended to be funny and grab your attention. Not because the script is crap, it's just like an extra level of humour. Lots and lots of comedy movies have very funny people, funny looking people in the background, especially if those, um, if they're really wacky comedies. You can add layers of humour by taking things that would normally be incidental in a movie in the background and just making them really funny. The Airplane movies or that movie Top Secret, you know, there was a whole bunch of those movies made in the 80s where it was a straightforward comedy film on one level, but then you could rewatch, ignore the story, ignore the central characters and just look at all the hilarious little things that were put in the backgrounds uh, for for repeat viewing that you can notice. I I think in Top Secret at the start of the film, uh, uh, you get a load of people running on the beach with surfboards, you know, like a like a Baywatch type thing. At one point uh, during that, you see a bunch of people running with the surfboards and one of them is like a an elderly woman <laughs> and she's got a surfboard and she's running like hell towards the beach. And that's funny. It's almost like a comment uh, upon the use of extras as well. So it's, uh, it's quite clever. But yeah, comedy is a great one for making unusual use of extras in the background to, to get a good laugh. Yeah, okay, so that is um, all of the notes I've got here on the psychology of movie extras. There's probably a hell of a lot more to say. Uh, Maybe if I sat down with half a dozen movies that have got a lot of extras and just took a lot of notes, I'd probably observe a lot more and have a lot more to tell you. But I hope that's a good start for you guys getting thinking about that subject. Okay, so now I'm going to get on with some of these other subjects. For those of you on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this little presentation. Uh, Don't forget... 
discounts on my website on lots and lots of downloads. Uh, got the video game released. Go buy a copy of that if you're willing to support me on it and uh, leave me a review on the game or send me some feedback or support me on Patreon. It helps me to get more stuff out for free. Uh, I am now going to carry on and do some of these other notes into short presentations and those will be available to my Patreon supporters definitely and possibly for sale on my website. Uh, I'll probably release those on the same day that I release this particular video on YouTube. Thanks for watching, folks. You've been listening to Rob Ager. Have a good one. Bye-bye.